Hello and welcome to Analog Insights. In today's episode, my friend Jules and I do a comparative review of the Nikon FM2 and the Nikon FE2. The FM2 is a fully mechanical 35mm single lens reflex camera with an unusual maximum shutter speed of 1 4 thousandths of a second and a built-in electronic light meter. The FM2 was first released in 1982 and built all the way up until 2001. The camera was directed at professionals but also at ambitious amateurs and many professionals used it as a spare body um, next to their F3, F4 or F5 cameras. The FE2 in comparison was released one year later in 1983 and only built until 1987, so a fairly short period of time. Um, in comparison to the FM2, it shares many of its features, but it comes with an electronically controlled quartz oscillator timed um, shutter with the same maximum shutter speed of one four thousandth of a second. But of course, it makes a big difference because in this case, this camera is dependent on uh, two LR44 batteries in order to operate. While in the case of the FM2, it's a fully mechanical camera that only takes the batteries to run the built-in light meter. Um, in this case, it came with a couple of improvements. So the shutter was improved um, and comes with um, eight honeycomb pattern instead of nine um, shutter blades, um, which reduces the shutter curtain travel time from 3.6 milliseconds down to 3.3 milliseconds. And of course, that was unheard of at the time. And the FE2 also introduced a feature to minimize um, the mirror shock vibration effects using a rotating flywheel plus inertial mass damping system. And this made a mirror lockup feature obsolete. We took the FM2 out on a photo walk at Wasserburg am Inn on a pretty overcast winter day, shooting some Ilford Delta 400 and some uh, Color Plus uh, 200. And then we took the FE2 out on um, a Sunday morning um, in Munich um, with a beautiful sunrise, shooting some slide film. And last but not least, I took the FM2 with me on a trip to Barcelona, shooting some Kent Mio 100 and giving the camera a try in a completely different setting. Yeah, we can't wait to share the results with you and our findings. Uh, let's dive in there into this comparative review of the Nikon FM2 and the Nikon FE2. So let's get some context first. The Nikon FM2 and FE2, as the name suggests, are improved versions of the original Nikon FM introduced in 1977 and the original FE um, introduced in 1978. In terms of cosmetics and controls, the cameras are very similar, but of course they come with a lot of improved internal features like brighter viewfinders, faster shutter speeds, and the different flash synchronization speed. The Nikon FA um, from 1983 also shares the same body design and what I found interesting is that even the limited production um, Nikon FM3A from um, 2001 that uh, was produced until 2006 also shares the very same body design. So you see something introduced in the late 1970s with, um, yeah, of course, certain improvements and slight changes, but going all the way up to 2006 with the same body design. So really, really impressive from an industrial design perspective. Taking um, a step backwards and looking at the wider context um, and the single lens reflex market at the time in the 1970s and 80s, 
um, it becomes apparent that there was fierce competition back then between Nikon, Canon, Minolta, um, Olympus and Pentax. And all these manufacturers try to open up and um, also not just reach professionals, but also introduce cameras that would be directed at ambitious consumers and encourage them to move away from their um, yeah, typical 1970s rangefinders with built-in leaf shutters and things like that to um, more yeah, advanced and interesting single lens reflex cameras. And of course, many were willing to do so, but it was really a hard to retain an overview of the market because there was so much innovation at the time and each manufacturer really tried to beat the other one by introducing a new um, feature, a new faster shutter speed and so on. And there were a lot of firsts at the time. And um, this also explains why when looking at these two cameras we see some firsts. Um, for the Nikon FM2 it was the first camera to introduce a one four thousandth of a second maximum shutter speed. And for the FE2, it was the flash synchronization speed of um, 1 250th of a second, which of course is also incredibly fast and uh, useful as a result of that. And um, that feature was quickly adapted to the FM2 in 1983, basically immediately after the introduction of the FE2. And from then on, it was called the FM2. N, but not on the front and you can only see that based on the serial numbers here at the back that always start with an N for these versions here. Um, early shutters were made of titanium, this is also important to mention, but then in 1989 they shifted to aluminum um, shutters um, because of yeah improved uh, production um, possibilities and capabilities. And what is also interesting is the price um, development um, when introduced in 19. 82, um, the FM2 body cost um, 364 US dollars um, for the US market and already in 1988 the price was 525 US dollars and it moved um, even further up to 745 US dollars in 1995 where it stayed until the camera was discontinued in 2001. And of course there is some inflation involved given the long period of time that it was sold but at the same time it also shows the willingness of the Nikon audience to pay a, a pretty hefty price for a high quality camera. The FE2 was directed at um, ambitious amateurs combining this high quality feel of the FM2 with a more um, yeah, precision electronic controls and also an aperture priority mode. The camera could be operated without batteries in the um, here um, manual mechanical shutter mode um, with marked M250. There was a mechanical 1 250th of a second um, fallback mode that also did not require a light meter. Otherwise, whenever you want to use the camera in any of the other modes, you basically need um, batteries for it to operate correctly. And yet what I found interesting is that Nikon's philosophy at the time was that advanced consumers um, and amateurs are not so much interested in having a lot of program modes, but instead want to retain control of their camera. So they only introduced that aperture priority mode for the FE2 um, and also marketed the cameras, both the FM2 and the FE2 at the time, um, con repeatedly highlighting how important control is and that you're not somebody who wants their decision being taken away and so on. Um, so this I found interesting and in terms of uh, prices um, the FE2 um, when introduced um, in chrome and in black the chrome body uh, the US list price was 446 US dollars um, but it was also worth, any, worth mentioning looking at all these prices that it was quite common to negotiate when purchasing such a camera and it was very common to get 30 to even 40 percent below the list price when purchasing the camera in combination with a couple of lenses and fitting accessories. Um, looking at today's market, both cameras are widely available um, and the FM2 can be had around 250 to 500 euros and the FE2 typically for um, 150 to 350 euro depending on the condition. And there is um, a limited um, titanium version of the FM2 that uh, typically starts at around 800 euro and can go all the way up to 2000 depending on the condition and depending on whether you get a full set with all sorts of accessories and so on. 
Um, yeah, but we found that worth mentioning. So overall, a really, really interesting um, historical context of these two cameras. <laughs> What about the features and the design of these two cameras? The Nikon FM2's most important feature is of course the advanced shutter. The original titanium shutter was 58% lighter than conventional shutters at the time and of course that because of the choice of material with titanium but also um, the ingenious honeycomb structure combined sturdiness with reliability and created uh, that incredible feat of uh, a maximum shutter speed of one four thousandth of a second but of course it also supported all the other shutter speeds down to one second plus featured a bulb mode. In general, when handling the camera today, you can feel the incredible manufacturing quality that went into it. It's a fairly compact camera. Um, it's about the same size as the Olympus OM-1 that really beat records at the time in terms of size. They really scaled down the um, single lens reflex cameras. And here this camera is only 30 gram um, heavier than the Olympus OM-1, so also pretty impressive. And yet you have a really high quality professional tool that operates in a wide variety of temperatures going down um, up to minus 40 um, degrees Celsius and all the way up to plus 50 um, degrees Celsius. And allegedly the Canadian government uses the um, Nikon FM2 until today um, to shoot in the Arctic because it's no problem at all to shoot in, in really um, yeah, uh, low temperature settings as well. Um, the built-in light meter can be, activating by, can be activated by releasing the film advance um, with your thumb and then depressing the shutter slightly. And the meter uses two silicon photodiodes which require the LR44 um, batteries, two of them, in order to operate. But in the same fashion like on the Olympus OM-1, this is um, an add-on feature so you may use the camera with the light meter but you don't have to. Um, it runs perfectly fine without it and um, the measured exposure is displayed on the right side of the viewfinder here via three vertically arranged LEDs with a plus, zero and minus indicator and the light meter is a 60 to 40 counterweight, um, counterweighted meter. Um, the differences between the earlier FM2 and the slightly updated FM2N were already mentioned. That is mostly the flash synchronization speed and as mentioned before you can see it in the serial numbers by the N. What is also interesting to mention is that you can recognize um, also the color or whether the color fits the serial numbers by looking at the serial numbers. So all the chrome ones um, should be um, higher than 72, um, 4, 9 and then um, the rest. Um, these are for the chrome bodies and everything higher than 73 um, are the black bodies. 
And uh, the la last versions of the MM2, uh, the FM2 feature a CE, which stands for Conformity European on the base plate. Um, so whenever you see that, you know this is one of the last versions produced. In contrast to the FM2, the FE2 is dependent on its batteries, as briefly touched on. It takes two LR44 batteries as well, and also features that automatic exposure um, aperture priority mode, um, which makes, of course, makes it particularly convenient to use and also interesting for um, shooting slide film and things like that. Um, the FE2 features a match the needle exposure control system with two needles pointing at a vertical shutter speed scale on the left side of the viewfinder to indicate the readings of the built-in, um, again, 60 to 40 percent um, standardated light meter versus the actual um, camera settings. So it basically suggests um, to, to change it using these two needles or to say, okay, it's perfectly fine and aligned. The film speed can be set um, using the wheel on the top left of the camera, um, but there are no um, the, the X codes uh, supported yet. So what about the lenses and accessories? Both cameras work perfectly fine with all lenses um, coming with the Nikon F Bayonet introduced in 1959 and the um, AI feature, the automatic indexing feature introduced in 1977. At the time, Nikon introduced a wide variety of fantastic lenses ranging from everything from a six mil millimeter um, wide angle fish eye lens to a 2000 millimeter super telephoto lens and everything in between. Nikon offers just fantastic lenses with different um, widest apertures or different qualities depending on your budget. You definitely find a fitting lens. What is interesting in this particular case is that the Nikon AF Nikon lenses can also be used but without autofocus and this opens up interesting options such as the 20 to 35 millimeter zoom lens. Beyond that the compatibility is a little bit tricky with newer lenses as is always the case the AF Nikon G type lenses without the aperture ring introduced in 2000 can be mounted but they are practically useless on the FE2 or FM2 um, as they can only be used at the widest aperture. The DX lenses are designed for specifically digital cameras will mount but the image circle is smaller and thus inadequate for the FE2 or FM2 and also any other 35mm Nikon using film. Um, IX Nikon lenses must not be mounted as the protruding rear elements might potentially damage the mirror box. Um, there's one special combination that we need to mention, and that is the fantastic um, Nikkor 45mm f2.8p 
lens that we also have here and used in combination with these cameras. Um, this lens was originally um, released um, for the Nikon FM3A and uh, also looks fantastic on either the FE2 or the FM2. The combination is extremely compact and light and beautiful in our opinion and still offers uh, fantastic optical results. Um, the lens was available in both silver and black and it's pretty hard to find these days, especially as a full set including the UV filter, lens hood, lens cap and the leather case. And none of these parts can be purchased separately, so um, of course they are, these full sets are heavily th sought after um, as each of the parts were custom made in, in terms of style and color and so on, so they perfectly fit this lens, even down to the rear um, lens cap. Um, in addition, there is a large variety of excellent manual focus um, lenses with the F-mount or F-bayonet um, uh, from, from other manufacturers. Of course, here we, we featured the 58mm um, Vogtländer lens, but of course there are also alternatives from other brands and even Carl Zeiss, which of course makes it fairly interesting. And um, there are a number of interesting accessories as well um, for the Nikon FE2 and FM2. For instance, there is uh, the Nikon MD 12 motor drive, which we used here, um, that supports automatic film advance with up to 3.2 frames per second, so pretty fast. And then there's also the MD, the motor drive 11, um, that is optically uh, the same, but where the MD 12 turns the light meter off after a few seconds of inactivity and um, it only becomes active after tapping the, the shutter um, release again. Um, the MD11 needs to be switched off manually each time and of course you tend to forget that and then that depletes the batteries and you often end up having uh, an empty um, battery because of that. Um, then there is the Nikon MF16 data bag, which offers sequential um, numbering, time or date stamping on the film. And then there are two electronic flashes with the Nikon SB15 or the Nikon SB16B. Um, um, the FE2 is better suited for flash use because it features TTL metering, so through the lens metering um, in, uh, to, in combination with the electronically controlled shutter and the flash speaking to each other, this of course is fantastic. Um, in the case of the FM2, you need to set the um, exposure manually for the flash, um, and, but nevertheless you do get a signal from the flash um, directly in the viewfinder when, once the flash is ready, so it does communicate with each other. Overall, as you can see, a pretty versatile, interesting system with a lot of accessories and fantastic lenses available. In my opinion, this setup is particularly well suited for faster shooting situations like weddings, fashion editorials, portrait sessions, faster reportages as well. Um, especially in that combination winder and or flash, uh, this is just amazing and both cameras are super well suited to cater to these uh, use cases.
So what about the handling and our personal impressions? Overall, we really enjoyed shooting both cameras and they are equals in many, many ways. Personally, I'm particularly fond of the Nikon FM2 because of its completely mechanical operation, high reliability and how it feels overall. Um, I particularly enjoyed using it during um, the trip to Par Barcelona and shooting a fashion editorial there on the beach in the wind. Not for a second did I fear that it would jam up on me and stop working. It was just super reliable, super quick. Um, you don't miss a beat because you immediately the mirror slaps up again. You, you see what's happening, you see the action, especially in combination with the wind that feels super, super fast and reliable. And looking at the final negatives, I was really blown away by the quality of the um, lenses and what it captures on the negatives and also the distances between the frames and everything just felt so perfect. And that with the camera being used in really harsh situations um, with the, the gust and the, the wind and, and all that at sea, at the seaside, it was just super, super reliable and nice. Um, the FE2 can certainly live up to that as well and especially in combination with the winder it feels super advanced and can certainly live up to more professional tools like the F5 even. Um, so a really, really great alternative if you are looking for this kind of um, feature set like an aperture priority mode, a fast winder, um, a fast automatic winder and so on and still don't mind having uh, a camera that basically needs batteries but appreciate the fast maximum shutter speed of one four thousandths of a second then the FE2 is certainly worth uh, a look as well. Um, the only thing that is worth mentioning is that there is one quirky feature about the FE2 that you basically need to advance the um, film to the very first frame in order for the light meter to operate correctly otherwise it shows something weird or does not work properly and of course you tend to forget about that if you don't have um, yeah, that in mind and then you would think, oh, I have to change the batteries of what's happening here, is it not working anymore? But it really comes down to advance into the first frame and then it's good to go. So this is a bug, uh, this is a feature, not a bug, but um, sometimes you feel like, oh, what's happening here? And then you remember, ah, oh, there was something about it. Um, furthermore, when wearing glasses, so in my case, um, I had no problem at all seeing the light meter reading on the right side with the FM2 um, in the viewfinder being a left eye shooter. There was not no problem at all, but in the case of the FE2, with that feature being on the left, the display, I had sometimes problems seeing that. Maybe that is interesting to you. Maybe this is very um, subjective and um, related to my case. And most importantly, um, when looking at these two cameras, the FE2 is always portrayed as the FM2's little sister because it was built for a shorter duration and so on. Um, and it has the electronically controlled shutter and so on. Um, but looking at it at face value, this is, there's no rational reason for that. These cameras are really equals and are beautiful. And in both cases, uh, they work fantastic. Um, they were also marketed a little bit different at the time and this is interesting so when looking at the old brochures that we have here the original ones the fm2 is portrayed as the camera for the cool yeah dude who appreciates uh, design and, and style and so on but nevertheless does not want a camera to make the decisions for them <laughs> so um, a, a wording that is really interesting and would be impossible today here and in the case of the FE2 it is more directed at technology nerds who would appreciate all the um, yeah, the electronics, the quartz oscillator time shutter, the aperture priority mode, and also the um, electronic accessories, the TTL metering, the flash, and even the data bag and so on. So a slightly different marketing um, here. In my perspective, a little bit comparable. It can be compared to how Leica is uh, marketing the completely mechanical Leica MA today. Um, so it feels a little bit to me how the FM2 was marketed, like for purists who want full control. And interestingly, when the production um, of the FE2 um, was discontinued in 1987, the used market, um, yeah, basically the, the prices increased um, on the used market, um, even over the original prices of the FE2 originally. Um, so um, it was so heavily sought after at the time. And with that in mind, it's super interesting to see um, 
how much cheaper it is today and if you are fond of that um, electronic um, technology and the features going in there um, then it's definitely a great great choice as well both cameras are really equal and there's not much of a reason to look at them as yeah the fe2 the little ugly sister so to speak um, of the fm2 that's there's no reason for that it's just yeah equally high performing cameras offering access to a, a lot of great accessories and in our opinion, it's really, it really comes down to a matter, matter of preference, whether you prefer a completely mechanical camera um, with the respective reliability, or you don't mind carrying in an extra spare parts of batteries, which you should anyways, right? And um, yeah, uh, rely on the electronically controlled shutter in the FE2. So thank you very much for watching. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Analog Insights and our comparative review of the Nikon FM2 and the Nikon FE2. Two beautiful cameras that basically live up to the very same standards, but one of them is comes with a mechanical shutter um, and an add-on light meter and no TTL metering, and the other one comes with an aperture priority mode and electronically controlled one four thousandth of a second shutter speed and TDL metering. Um, both have access to fantastic lenses and accessories, so really, really fantastic cameras that we can highly recommend taking a look at. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like it and maybe even share it with your friends. And if you want to see more videos like this, please subscribe to our channel. Jules, Greg and I really appreciate each and every subscriber coming our way. So thank you for watching. We hope to see you soon. Bye.